Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and for today's lesson we will be learning about Charles Darwin and evolution by means of natural selection. And I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard of Charles Darwin, but did you know that by the summer of 1858, at the age of 50, Darwin had written a quarter of a million words in evolution and published none until he received a letter that compelled him to go public. This letter came from a young naturalist named Alfred Russell Wallace. In this letter, Wallace described a theory of evolution by means of natural selection he had thought of and wanted Darwin's advice on how to publish. This theory was the exact same theory Darwin had been working on for 20 years. One, he had no intentions of publishing at the time. Reading it, Darwin realized that if he didn't go public quickly, then Wallace would get to take credit for the idea of evolution by means of natural selection. So what did Darwin do? What happened to Wallace? And what is natural selection anyways? All of that will be answered in this lesson. But first, let me just clarify one common misconception. That is that Charles Darwin did not come up with the idea of evolution. The idea of evolution, that species change over time, has been around since the time of the ancient Greeks, Romans, and Chinese. What had not yet been proposed was a mechanism by which evolution occurred. That is until the early 19th century, when Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed his theory of the transmutation of species, the first fully formed theory of evolution. Lamarck had this idea that physical changes an organism acquires during their lifetime, like if they develop an organ or a body part through increased use, could be transmitted to their offspring. This idea of evolution via acquired characteristics influenced evolutionary thought for much of the 19th century. An understanding of genetics and heredity, of course, disproves this theory. Because even if an organism can change its features through use, changes acquired during a lifetime cannot be passed on to offspring. However, the point remains that the idea of evolution had been around for a while. What Darwin and Wallace gave the world was a mechanism by which it could happen. And not only did he propose an ingenious mechanism for evolution, Darwin provided a detailed account of his theory when he published On the Origin of Species on November 24, 1859, an immediate bestseller that was backed by clear and well-researched evidence he had collected and worked on for 20 years. But let's back up a bit. Charles Erasmus Darwin had a privileged childhood. He had a passion for nature and collecting. Young Charles originally wanted to become a physician, a doctor, but he hated the sight of blood, so he quit medical school and went to Cambridge to study for the clergy, but instead spent most of his time collecting beetles and in discussions with a naturalist by the name of John Henslow. It was John Henslow who arranged for Darwin to join an expedition on the HMS Beagle as a naturalist and a companion to the captain. This five-year-long expedition to chart the South American coastline is now one of the most famous expeditions in biology, thanks to Charles Darwin, who was only 22 years old when he set sail. During that trip, Darwin read geological theories of Charles Lyell, which made him think about gradual change over a long time. And then he got to observe how these geological changes can happen when he felt a strong earthquake when he was in Chile and saw the effects it had on the geography around him. But the main thing that the voyage did was give Charles access to hundreds of specimens from similar looking species that lived close to each other, but in slightly different environments. The most famous examples, of course, came from the Galapagos Islands, home to many unique species, like marine iguanas, unique among lizards. This creature can live on both land and in the sea. Giant tortoises of various species inhabit in different islands in the Galapagos, and a variety of birds, among them the now famous Galapagos finches. The different species seemed to vary according to the islands in which they lived, which was one of a number of clues that would lead him to develop the theory of evolution by natural selection. The voyage also gave Darwin lots of opportunities to collect and compare fossils. For instance, Darwin found fossils of what looked like a giant sloth and one that looked like a giant armadillo. He was intrigued by the fact that these fossils of long extinct animals were found in areas where similar species lived. 
he thought, what if these great giant creatures did not just coincidentally look like sloths or armadillos, but were in fact their ancestors? During his time in the Galapagos, Darwin also collected a variety of finches, 13 different species, all adapted to different food sources based on where they lived within the Galapagos Islands. On his return to England, Darwin worked closely with ornithologist John Gould to study the various species of finch that he had brought back from the Galapagos, and they noticed that the finch species varied in size and shape of their beaks, and that this variation was based on their diet. There was a warbler finch with a very fine needle-like beak, perfect for picking insects, a woodpecker finch with a sturdier beak that eats beetle larvae from tree trunks, a cactus finch with a sharper beak that could be used to get in between cactus flowers, and different sized ground finches with strong beaks that could crack seeds. There were even finches that used tools. So how did the Galapagos end up with so many different species of finches? Well, Darwin's conclusions, which have now been backed by genetic analysis of the birds, was that a small population of mainland finches arrived at the Galapagos and migrated to different islands where they encountered different conditions and food sources. Variation in beaks enabled individuals to gather food successfully in the different environments. Of course, those who did not have the right beak type to get food would be unable to survive long enough to have babies and pass on their less adaptive beaks. However, those with beaks that were better suited for gathering food in their new habitat got to survive, reproduce, and pass on those traits to their babies. Over time, new species emerged as each group became better and better adapted to their food source. It is important to note that Darwin was not just influenced by his observation during his voyage on the HMS Beagle. He was influenced as well by the works of others, in particular Charles Lyell's book on geology, which proposed that the Earth must be very old to account for geological changes in land masses. In the writings by Thomas Malthus, who observed that the human race would be likely to overproduce if the population size was not kept under control, and introduced Darwin to the concept of competition for survival. After he returned from his travels, Darwin married his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, in 1839. That's right, his cousin. They had ten kids, seven of which survived to adulthood, and moved to a manor in Kent. He helped in publishing of a five-part series of books that provided an account of the collections of specimens gathered during his voyage. This alone made Darwin a serious naturalist and a well-respected member of London's scientific world. He also spent eight years studying barnacles, and he raised pigeons in order to understand artificial selection. What Darwin wasn't doing was publishing his theory of natural selection. He wrote about it, but did not even attempt to publish. By the 1850s, he had described his ideas in evolution to a few trusted friends like Charles Lyell, the same who wrote Principles of Geology that so influenced Darwin's views, who urged him to publish before someone else came to the same conclusion and published first. That summer in 1858, when Charles Darwin received a letter from a young Alfred Russell Wallace detailing his theory of evolution by means of natural selection, he was stunned. On a letter to his friend Lyell, Darwin said, Your words have come true with a vengeance. I never saw a more striking coincidence. So all my originality, whatever it may amount to, will be smashed. Alfred Russell Wallace was a young naturalist who spent most of his life traveling, studying nature, and collecting specimens for museums, which was how he made his money. He notably once lost all specimens he had collected after four years spent in the Amazon when the ship he was traveling on caught fire. He was rescued after spending 10 days in a rowboat in the middle of the ocean. So unlike Darwin, Wallace was not rich and he was not well known in the scientific community. But like Darwin, he had read Malthus's essays on population and had observed during his travels that different environments seemed to produce different populations of organisms. He also read many of Darwin's papers, and even met him briefly, which was why, after a theory of evolution by means of natural selection came to him while sick in bed, he wrote Charles Darwin about it, asking for his advice on how to publish it. This left Darwin in a moral quandary. As well as agonizing over whether to speak out, 
he had to decide how to treat Wallace fairly. What was decided was that Lyell would present a joint letter detailing their theory at a meeting of the Linnaean Society of London, a meeting of biologists where scientific discoveries and ideas are presented, debated, and discussed. Neither Wallace nor Darwin attended the meeting. Wallace was across the world working in remote islands on the Indian Ocean, and as for Darwin, tragically, his one-and-a-half-year-old son had died a few days before. Only about 30 people heard the papers we presented, and the presentation really did not make too much of an impression at the time. However, having already presented his idea, Darwin went on to publish On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection a year later, on November 24th of 1859. A 500-page book written for non-specialist readers which attracted widespread interest upon its publication. The compelling evidence detailed in the book generated scientific and philosophical discussion, as well as more than a fair bit of controversy. And this is what we mostly hear about Darwin when talking about natural selection, and not so much about Wallace. Even when Alfred Russell Wallace did write a book on natural selection 10 years later, he titled it Darwinism. So as described in The Origin of Species, Darwin's theory of evolution included two ideas. Descent with modification, the idea that species change over time, give rise to new species, and share a common ancestor, and that the diversity of life is a product of modifications of populations by a process of natural selection, where some traits were favored in an environment over others. So how does natural selection work? Natural selection is one of the key mechanisms of evolution and can occur in a population if there is variation, differential reproduction, and heredity. Traits that increase fitness, the ability to survive and reproduce, become more common and change the characteristics of a population over time. Let's say there is variation in a trait within a population, which arises through random mutations, and some forms of that trait increase the organism's ability to survive in its environment. Since the environment can't support an unlimited population growth, not all individuals get to reproduce to their full potential. Differential reproduction is not random. Those with the best adaptation get to survive longer and have more offspring. The offspring from those better adapted organisms will go on to have greater survival and reproductive success, greater fitness. And the trait has a genetic basis. It is passed down to offspring. The more advantageous trait, which allows the organism to have the most offspring, will then be inherited in greater numbers and will become more common in the population, which will in turn change the frequency of the alleles for that trait. So after many generations, a trait that was once rare appears more frequently, becoming the norm within species. If this process continues, eventually, over a period of time, most individuals in the population end up expressing the most adaptive trait and the trait could even become exaggerated in the population. Natural selection can help us understand how over an even greater time span in an ever-changing environment, a population can continuously change, adapting to the selective pressure of its environment and leading to the formation of new species. If two populations of one species are changing in response to different environmental pressures, over time they can become separate species which is how the process of natural selection can explain the origin of species. And that's it for this lesson. I will talk to you soon.